two. Uno. One. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, Ooh. and welcome back to another exciting <laughs> and, and yet fruitful uh, <laughs> just dessert beginning to a well, uh, that was a mess. A, a, to a the town. theme of local horror films, which <laughs> obviously we are very pleased with ourselves with last round. So, uh, uh, why don't we uh, go over to Dane? Uh, who well, first, let me little... apologize for burping in your mic there, bro. That was supposed to be the mic that got muted, but I turned off the camera instead. I'm going to use macros on my keyboard to hotkey that so that don't happen again. Uh, well, apologies. at least we know who the walrus in the room is. <laughs> True enough. Sorry, that was just too perfectly timed. I just <laughs> Sorry. Okay. No. <laughs> so, dang. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the film that we were uh, subjected to tonight? <laughs> subjected to, oh my, such a chore. Uh, <laughs> uh, sorry, but well, yes, uh, to, you know tonight we, we talk about the really, uh, really Hollywood films. Oh uh, yeah, and this is this is definitely in the tradition of Lloyd Kaufman, make your own damn movie, which. Uh, Kevin Smith has always been in that tradition, just in his own way. Um, and this was definitely a make-your-own-damn-movie kind of movie. And uh, this movie is Tusk. It's uh, Kevin Smith's uh, return to filmmaking after thinking that he was done with making movies after Red State. Um, but uh, it came about as a result of an episode of Smodcast, where basically he and Scott Mosier had come across a story... That was later revealed to be a fake, but it was um, supposedly it was a posting that said that, you know, such and such person in Canada would offer free room and board to somebody who for two hours a day would dress up as and behave as a walrus. Yeah, that was the supposed advertisement. And they thought it was just so funny that as they started talking about it. It started, the story started to take shape, and then they were like, well, would you, the audience out there, like to see this as a movie? Vote Walrus Yes or Walrus No, and everybody voted Walrus Yes, so boom, the movie got made. Just by I trying like to... see that as a reality, man, because oh, cost of living is... See, I didn't yeah, even realize that. I would do it, that. I think. I didn't Just realize that. a walrus that. suit for two hours, <laughs> you know? That's, you know, that... Well, that's important because that is essentially the plot, or at least the impetus for it. Um, and the whole premise of the movie, production-wise, was to try to make it kind of like an open-source kind of movie, let people in on the whole process of what it takes to make a movie, a movie that Hollywood, mainstream Hollywood, would never think to make. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so it really is a make-your-own-damn movie kind of movie, which for our regional horror, uh, I selected for North Carolina, even though it is set in Manitoba, Canada, and has a very clearly Canadian identity, it was still shot in North Carolina, which is kind of funny because normally Canada doubles for the U.S., so this was kind of a reversal. Um, yeah, that is interesting. It's yeah. very interesting. But yeah, this uh, was Kevin Smith's second horror film, uh, after having done Red State. And, uh, you know, for my money, it's uh, one of my favorites of his. I put it at number four, uh, which some people love this movie. Some, yeah, some people love this movie. Some people hate it. Uh, I'm a big fan of body horror, and I think this is a pretty darn good one. Um, and we'll get into that when the plot uh, comes about. But some intro to how the film got made and why I think it's a good one. Um, but uh, the very, very basic plot, besides the plot of how the movie got made, the very basic plot is that uh, a podcast <coughs> goes to Canada seeking a story of sorts for his podcast, isn't able to find it, so he stumbles upon that advertisement, which is essentially the same as the one that was supposedly up in real life. Um, goes to a mansion in Manitoba in the middle of absolute nowhere and 
gets into a whole lot more than he bargained for, such that he has to become the walrus. Uh, he has to undergo a horrific man, a horrific man to walrus transformation. Not just any walrus, Mr. Tusk. That's correct. Um, and that's the basic plot overview, but as far as first impressions, I saw this maybe earlier last year or something like that. I, it was relatively recent, and uh, I remembered really digging it because I I had not seen all of Kevin Smith's films yet. I have now, uh, but I had not at the time. I'd seen like some of the big ones. I'd seen Dogma. I'd seen Clerks. I'd seen Chasing Amy. Uh, this was the first horror film of his that I'd seen, and he's still relatively new as far as horror films go. But uh, I thought this one for uh, for body horror, which is a tragically underserviced subgenre of horror these days, I think it was quite effective. Uh, it also draws upon a rich pool of horror archetypes from Frankenstein and Dracula, the main character or the main villain, uh, Howard. He is very much like Dracula mixed with Victor Frankenstein in a lot of ways. So it's got the classic horror archetypes. It's got the body horror. It's got some comedy. It's got some grotesquerie. It's got all kinds of greatness and it's all up there in beautiful Canada. eh? Um, (laughs) But yeah, I, I, those are some first impressions really dug it. What about you, Forrest? All right. So, actually, so actually this was my uh, this is my first time seeing it since it came out. I actually did see it in the I actually did see it in theaters mm-hmm. when it came out. Um, you know, you know, because you know, here you know, I get. Um, well, okay. So, I'm a, so I was already a, f- a huge fan of Kevin Smith. A huge fan of Kevin Smith. Um, Clerks uh, was one of those movies that made me, made me want to make movies. Um, I was, you know, I was so I was big into, I was big into the, the whole the whole View Askew universe. I had seen Red State and, and liked it, uh, so I went to go see this one, uh, kind of not knowing what to expect. And I, it was, I bet I, at, to this very day, I still don't know what to make of it. I get to me, it always felt like uh, if the Human Centipede and Strange Brew had a one night stand. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> That is the best <laughs> description of this movie I've ever heard. I, I love that <laughs> proof. And it was, yeah, it was just so, I was just like, I was just very like, what the fuck? I was just like, I walked out of there like, what the fuck was that? Uh, uh-huh. I didn't hate, you know, it was not, it was, it wasn't, it definitely, it wasn't, it definitely wasn't something I hated. It wasn't something I hated, but it, it wasn't, I don't know. I didn't just know what to make of it. It's like, much like, much like Human Centipede. Yeah. Uh, that's. <laughs> Uh, it was it was it was something. Uh, it has that effect on people, I think. <laughs> yeah, although I did find, although I kind of felt, like, although I will say though, the one really really neg- negative thing I will say about it is Johnny Depp. I kind of felt like his shtick got was a little too drawn out. Um, Johnny you, Depp was uh, in this. Yes. You, uh, yeah. Yeah. He was, he was, he was the, the French detective you, dude, the Club you, 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 you did you did not like. Uh, he, was, he was. Point he to, he, uh, he was more. The, he was Mordecai in disguise. <laughs> he was definitely in disguise. Like I didn't recognize him at all. Oh yeah. Well, again, yeah. He's yeah, not neither did I the first time. I in the cast. He's credited entirely as Guy Lapon. That's right. But yeah, he is he is the man hunter from Quebec and uh, he has uh, the funny voice right. and he has the uh, f- funny gives him Well, and actually f- f- this is a very subtle right. thing but actually um Actually, I'm th- actually I'm, I'm kind of surprised he didn't, he wasn't eating poutine with his burger. Yeah, <laughs> well, the, said, uh, he, I think he was lactose or something, you know, uh, like it gave him bad shits, so he didn't eat that's poutine, right. which is tragic because poutine's delicious. Yeah, you know, the, right? uh, well, very very quickly before we keep going, but very quickly, uh, Kevin Smith knew and still knows Johnny Depp through his daughter's school because they were schoolmates and really good friends. And uh, they knew each other through social events and stuff, never, ever thought about working together. Uh, But then, you know, Kevin Smith couldn't get Quentin Tarantino to play that part like he wanted. And so he said, well, who, you know, he's like, fuck it, just ask him, Uh, ask Johnny Depp. And Johnny Depp was like really enthusiastic about it because he didn't get offered weird 
off the wall shit anymore uh on when he was being uh you know the superstar and everything now his star's kind of fallen unfortunately but um he was really excited to do it and you know he was able to be in it and he was like would you mind paying for the makeup a makeup guy and uh he was like oh you want to wear makeup and he's like yes johnny depp wants to wear makeup go figure and uh <laughs> He actually wears this big prosthetic nose, and if you look, there's actually a, a cut on the tip. And uh, he was showing Kevin Smith, and he was like, "Doesn't that look like a dick?" And uh, and uh, Kevin Smith is like, "Are you telling me you want to wear a dick on your face in this movie? Because if you've ever wanted to wear a dick on your face, Tusk is the fucking movie to do it." And <laughs> so you you can see the little cut on his on his nose there, and there's like a a slight like blue vein on there too. So it's pretty ingenious stuff. <laughs> Uh, and on that note, uh, how about you, Mo? Tell us what you thought of this piece of work. Oh, I loved it, man. I mean, it's I saw this, it couldn't have been too long after it came on home video. It was probably right when it hit the streaming sites, you know? And I loved it. It was ridiculous. I mean, it's, it's fucking stupid because it's supposed to be. It, yeah. It's just absolutely supposed to be so absurd that by the time it hits the disturbing shit, it's like, wow. Uh, this is this is kind of bothering me more than I thought it would because I've seen yeah. movies like that, like Human Centipede, and it's like, oh, this should be no big deal. He's, he turns the guy into a walrus. How bad could that be? Uh, it, it stuck with me. It was the first movie. I think I said it in chat a while back. It, it was the first movie in a long time at that point that had made me think about it for a few days afterwards. Like when you watch a lot of really messed up movies, eventually you yeah. see stuff that you know, it's stuck in your brain. It comes to you in the middle of a shift at work, and it's like, yeah, that was weird. Yeah, you know, that's, that's and a great Tusk feeling. was the first yeah. movie that I... It really is. And Tusk was the first movie that had done that to me in ages. You uh, know? I don't know that any movie's done it to me on that level since, because it was like, man, the way he's, like, shrieking and squawking in that yeah. friggin' walrus suit just bothers me. Speaking of oh, which, I have that, the yeah. movie... I have the movie physically... And what's that right there? That's Kevin Smith's signature, which is pretty cool. Wow. Nice. Yeah. Good one to have. Yeah, the man himself. Yeah. Um, cool. But uh, what about you there, Jake? This was one that I actually, I think it slipped by me when it came out. I used to be a pretty big Kevin Smith fan. I was introduced, I think I went into this when we talked about Clerks, that I was introduced to it uh, probably through Dogma, uh, because I did see that in theaters. And I was with a group at college that were big Kevin Smith fans. And my coworkers told me about Mallrats and Clerks, and I watched those. And, you know, and then for a while, I... Kevin Smith bugs me. I feel like the man, I feel like he has tremendous potential, Mm -hmm. but he likes to fall into the same, he likes to take it easy. He doesn't Mm -hmm. challenge himself the way some directors do. And when he does, he doesn't always do it with enough force to truly, truly grow in any one direction. Like, I thought Chasing Amy was great, but it fell short of brilliant because of its predilection for dick and fart jokes, you know, and... I think he's just trying to have fun making movies, man. He does. That's always the vibe I've gotten from him, was that he's not trying to be brilliant, you know? he's trying. I do agree with that reading of it. Like, Jay and Silent Bob Reboot is objectively not a great film, but it's a great fan film. Mm -hmm. Like, if you are a fan of his movies, you will enjoy it. Because oh, definitely. it's a love layer to fans. But objectively, the acting's way over the top and whatever. But so when this one came out, it was in a, it was in a, like you said, he had kind of taken a bit of a break. It was mm-hmm. in the wake of Cop Out, which I had seen and uh, it was depressing. And, yeah. and I think I had seen Red State when this came out. I definitely saw Red State long before I saw this. Had I not seen Red State, I would have been taken aback because they are his horror films and they are completely different from his comedies in a lot of ways. Uh, They have a lot in common. The man does have a good grasp on Creeping Dread. He Mm -hmm. does have a good grasp on creating an atmosphere. He, 
he could, he could be a great horror director if he stuck with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he's also really good at interjecting humor where you wouldn't necessarily expect it. <laughs> and in this one, Michael Park's character is a great, great example. He is funny as hell and creepy as hell, all in the same thing. He kills and it in this movie. He killed it. Yeah, exactly. And, and he, he was he killed it in Red State too. He was much less funny in Red State, but he definitely was great in that one too. Oh, um yeah. But this was this morning definitely was the first time I sat down and watched this because I am not a body horror fan. It tends to bug me. It tends to wig me out. I don't like what Mo described of these images just randomly surfacing in your brain days later. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Some aspects of movies, I love when that happens, but not this one. Um, (laughs) But So I dreaded this one because of its reputation. But I finally watched it, and it's really not that bad. And even the grotesquerie didn't get as bad as I feared. And it had enough Kudos to you for going at it, though, bud. Yeah. As disgusting and stupid as we made it sound. You're jumping out there. I had to watch it eventually because it's a Kevin Smith movie. His only feature I haven't seen yet is Yoga Hosers, and I'll get to it eventually. Yoga but, Hosers was okay. I've seen that. I have that. I, I yeah. didn't hate I didn't I saw, hate it. Yoga Hosers, uh, I saw the trailer for it watching this movie. <laughs> I, I did not hate Yoga Hosers. It's not one of his best, but I didn't hate it. Right. But, Which... um Yeah. And I did like how those two girls agreed with me that this could have been a mustache matinee pick. But yeah. <laughs> how well, they actually uh, called him Mr. Mustache. That's right. Well, and, and that's uh, Harley Quinn, uh, right. Harley, Harley Quinn, Quinn Smith, Smith, and Lily, Lily Rose, Rose Depp. Depp. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they, they do a spectacular job in this and in Yoga Hosers also. Like they're. And I had seen, like I said, I had already seen Jane Silent Bob Reboot, which uh, Harley Quinn Smith plays a key role in that one. Yeah. So. Yeah, she's, she's, she's got some legitimate talent. Yeah. Um, now, uh, is Dustin, is he the walrus or is Dave the walrus? We have to find out. Dustin, are you the walrus? Um, perhaps. Um, so, I saw this for the You're first my time. Walrus. This, I saw. <laughs> <laughs> I saw this movie for the first time today, and I actually misunderstood what it was about. So, this is, this movie had had been on my radar since it came out, and I'd always intended to see it. Uh, I just never got around to it, and so I thought that this was a werewolf movie, except he turns into a walrus. Oh, what? Hell yeah, werewolf. that needs that, to that happen. That would have been. <laughs> that would have definitely been better than uh, whatever the hell it was I saw. And it's an interesting <laughs> fantasy of I am like, the walrus singing throughout. Why don't you? <laughs> why, don't, uh, why don't you write that movie? That'd be pretty sweet. <laughs> I thought it. Uh, I thought it dragged really bad in the first hour. Um, like it felt three hours long. Hmm. Um, Until he gets to his house, really, it just feels like it's almost bordering on becoming like an American Pie movie or some bullshit. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I do find stuff funny in that first part of it, but then also it's just sort of like, ugh. like mm-hmm. when, once he starts talking to the dude and you start hearing his stories and then it starts getting creepy, like it fucking gets, you know, banging. Mm. I'm sorry, Dustin, continue. I just, I do agree. No, it's, it's just, uh, I ended up not liking it very much. Um, mm. I think because I had imagined like what sounds like a much better movie. Well, you wanted head. your uh, you wanted your wall wolf movie. Mm-hmm. That's what we're gonna call it—a wall wolf <laughs> or a werewolf. <laughs> yeah, a werewolf. Yeah. Werewolf. Yeah. I was I was I was pretty let down overall. Um, hmm. so this is, this is one that you're not going to be hearing a lot of praise for this movie from me. <laughs> I'm just going to go ahead and, and submit Night of the Walrus as a title for this potential right. movie. There you go. Yeah, that, that's a good, that's a good pick. Well, hey, I mean. We don't, the, we don't have to the, stumble over the word there and we can, you know. Well, this, it's, it's well, this movie, 
this movie did derive from a podcast, so hey, maybe the next one could be derived from this show. Why not? <laughs> I mean, if nothing else, uh, this movie proves that ideas can come from any source and can be followed up on and seen through to their logical conclusion, all that stuff. I mean, part of... I, I would have to kind of disagree with what Jacob said with uh, him not trying or whatever. I think he has tried and done a lot more than a lot of people could uh certainly in terms of saying you know especially with this movie it's like could this movie that kind of push whimsy or whatever could this i worded it i worded it poorly um i feel like i i get what you're saying is that like stylistically i i I get he likes his you know potty humor he likes the uh the people just sitting around yeah. shooting shit the way that people do without worrying about whether the critics will like it or not. And yeah. I give him props for that, but I feel like he's rarely tried. One thing I will give Tusk and I'll go ahead and throw this out there. I was very pleased that there was a clear delineation in character in who was using that sort of language and who was not. Yeah. Like Michael Parks had the very highfalutin almost Cohen esque dialogue Whereas Justin Long was much more your stereotypical Kevin Smith character. And well, uh, I like the, that. The, uh, the thing that I found with him is that I think in the times when he has, this is more unfairness on behalf of the critical community. Mm-hmm. The times when he has really tried to grow up and try to do things differently, most notably with Jersey Girl, which mm-hmm. I think is, I think is pretty criminally underrated. underrated. Like when when he's really tried to it be more mainstream or whatever, mm-hmm. the critical community and to a certain extent the audience, but especially the critical community, just rakes him over the coals needlessly. And so I think part of that comfort zone thing is because, well, you know, you get beaten up so bad by people that, you know, you do what what works with the people who like you or whatever. So, I mean, I understand that temptation, but I do. But I, I liked the fact that this film does show that, you know, he can surround himself with good people in the visual department, too, because his films never really get talked about as visual mm-hmm. experiences because they're really not. They're mostly dialogue. But like this one has some of his creepiest cinematography in it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Now, we have not touched upon David's impressions. So is David the walrus? <laughs> I am here and you are here and we are all together. Exactly. Um, <laughs> my, uh, my perspective of this film is I saw a lot of... Uh, interview sites like starting to talk up about this really like putting some buzz on it and uh uh this was in 2014 around the time when i was starting to uh, to do uh, uh, write for my own blog and shit like that so um this was i i waited until it was like cheap enough for me to get and then I uh, p- picked it up at Walmart for like 12 bucks or something like that. And um, Kevin Smith is, has always been a mixed bag for me. Um, it, it, you, you either love him or hate him. And a, a lot of the people that I grew up around loved his films, whereas I went into many of them not really understanding some of the humor, uh, uh, some of it. But I will say that Mall, Co- uh, Mall Rats was my favorite Kevin Smith film. Mallrats um, Mall is great. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that will always be his number one film. What ranks number two in that is, I think, this film. Because this was the first time I actually paid att- attention to, uh, 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 to his film. I didn't see Red State. I have it, but I haven't seen it. So this was the first horror film from Kevin Smith that I actually saw uh, saw and though it was a sleeper it did have that american pie vibe going on uh, on it did have some elements of as Boris said i love how he put, uh, put it as like a love child of uh, of, <laughs> of, of of say strange brew and uh human centipede human centipede 
the thing is, I was also getting some Jeepers Creepers vibes. Yeah, and the thing is, Justin Long. Justin Long, well, not just because of Justin Long, but that ending. It, 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 I mean, Justin Long in yeah. Jeepers Creepers ended up... Gets with, some with, into other people's flesh. Yeah. yeah. Like, it's, it's not the first time for him. It's, it's, yeah. it's not his first body horror film. So, uh, so uh, he... Uh, Kevin Smith definitely understood how to bring that same effect around, and it bugged me, and it bugged my fiance at the time when we watched it. We were like, "Whoa!" <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh, and she—that's one that she uh, she uh, ultimately kept on uh, asking me afterwards, "What was that movie again?" Oh yeah. You know, uh, it, it was one that she uh, she actually enjoyed out of some of the films that I bring to uh, to her attention, and it was yeah. like one that uh, that she a- actually has to admit that uh, it bothered her. <laughs> so yeah. it's it's funny that uh, Kevin Smith himself. Whenever he talks about Tusk, he always refers to it as that stupid fucking walrus movie, <laughs> which is just great. Uh, I thought it was one of the, one of his best, or uh, in fact, it was his best horror film out of so far. The uh, uh, Yoga Hosers was crap. I don't care who, <laughs> but um, I, there's nothing good I can say about that movie. <laughs> oh, I, I can say plenty of good things about it. I mean, who else, like, really, who else could have made a movie like that? And, you know, if you're, it's, like, I'm not saying it's a great film because it's not, but, like, I would much rather take a not-so-great movie that had some imagination and originality than something like Cop Out that was just studio garbage. Um, I never saw Cop Out, so I can't uh, say. I'm telling you, if you saw it, you'd be it's, like, oh, it's appropriately titled. Well, if if you saw it, I guarantee you'd be like, give me yoga hosers again, please. At least this had some creativity. Um, but let's get, do we do everybody's first impressions? I think we did. Um, so let us yep. get into some quick plot here. We've got uh, mm-hmm. our two uh, podcasters uh, who are played by Justin Long and um, Haley Joel Osment. Nice to see I them. See that. People yeah. always have child nice. hands. Yeah, nice yeah. to see nice how sick yeah. he gets. He, he's yeah, just nice going to have those little kid hands and that little kid face. Nice he's slowly turning him. into Al Borland. You know, nice, nice, to, <laughs> nice to see him getting some adult work, which is he nice. He needs to do a, a movie with Richard Karn. You know, yeah. where they're like, like yeah, they're I, I didn't recognize it was him at all. Oh, yeah, he's, like, he's, he's also in Future Man, looking even more like Al Borland, which is awesome. He's just missing the flannel, bro. Yeah. He has had a fascinating uh, adult career. Uh, the same year this came out, he was in a great TV miniseries that I, I don't know if anyone else saw The Spoils of Babylon, but that was yeah, such a know. great little miniseries. It was totally screwed up. <laughs> Well, they basically, he uh, and Justin Long, they're basically podcasters right. who, uh, which you got to love the title, the Not See Party. Right. That's just, I, I love the the parody of the famous Captain America number one cover uh, on the wall. That's great. Mm-hmm. Um, but they're, they're basically making fun of viral YouTube videos and... Uh, they do the whole thing's a it's a parody of Star Wars kid, but it's the Kill Bill kid where he accidentally severed his leg with a katana, goes to Manitoba to interview the kid and finds out he commits committed suicide. So he's like, Well now what am I gonna write a, a podcast about? And that's when he stumbles upon that advertisement in the bathroom and uh goes off to meet our dear uh Howard Howe. Um but what do we think of in those opening scenes there? What do we think of Wallace Brighton, played by Justin Long, our mustachioed he's protagonist? A dick. Like, he's a dick. He's a dick. Just a dick with a capital like a B. And just yeah. also, kids, don't ever follow advice you get on restroom walls, even if it is on like a handbill. Just don't do it. Unless it's a concert or like some type of film festival that's happening, fucking ignore it because it's so always well, gross. We- or we has some call, ulterior motive. We can't call you for a good time. Is that what you're saying? 
Probably not, bro. I mean, yeah. you can, but not somebody who got my number off the wall of the loo. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, so, the, uh, that, that that epic mustache couldn't save him. Is that what we're all saying? I do like the mustache. <laughs> I'm think I think me and Jake are probably in agreement on this. The dude's a bit of uh, an asshole, but the mustache is, is a fine piece of work. Yeah. But I will say I like Justin Long as an actor, and I think that he does do a great job with the character. But mm-hmm. yeah, he really is a dick. So you you start off the movie going like. I don't know about this guy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Which uh, I now I personally I'm a big fan of movie protagonists who start off pretty unlikable because that gives you some good room to build up from, and there's mm-hmm. something to be said for characters that start off unlikable because then you see kind of what they have to be put through in order to either ascend or to even get worse, you know, because sometimes it's about seeing how far they descend even from where they already are. Mm -hmm. So a little scummy about Haley Joel, though, too, in the opening bits of this. You can't just be looking like an eight-year-old banging dudes' girlfriends behind their back, even if if they are pieces of crap, man. Like, that's just weird. Yeah, that's fucking kid it, hands that's... grabbing your cell phone there. And <laughs> well, that's that, one of the, means, that's that just one means of the... his girlfriend secretly a show to Connor Hart. Well, and that's one of <laughs> the common uh, Will's uh, uh, one of the common uh, Kevin Smith tropes. There is uh, a guy who's being being cheated on or has been cheated on. Uh, that's that's pretty common in his films. Mm-hmm. Um, but he goes to meet our dear uh, Howard Howe, who's in this Manitoba mansion in the middle of nowhere, way the hell outside of uh, Winnipeg, which is like the big mm-hmm. city in Manitoba. And uh, Howard Howe uh, has some stories to tell and just wants to tell someone who wants to hear them. And uh, that's when he imparts the knowledge of our dear Mr. Tusk, who supposedly rescued him after a shipwreck. Mm-hmm. Now, what do we think of our dear Howard Howe? Uh, he's an interesting guy. character. <laughs> I, you know, I think the initial meeting is telling of both him and the other dude because you get a good idea of Howard's character, but then also Justin Long's character. Like, I don't know, man. At both times that I've watched this, like, in memory it bothers me that he's still so like crude in front of the old dude because he Uh says things in a more, I don't know. He's just like the type of old person. I think if I was around him just to be polite, I would adjust my way of speaking and maybe not like be crude or swear or things like that. Well, Uh, I do feel like he calls him out on it. Like there's a part where Brighton is playing with that piece, the walrus. Oh, and he tells him he's a rap scallion of the highest order or whatever. (laughs) (laughs) Well, uh, he, the walrus is far more evolved than any man I've oh, ever that, known. Yeah. Present company included. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. You're welcome. Yeah. What an idiot. <laughs> uh, but I mean, it's just such a classic meeting, and it does have that vibe almost of like right. when, you know, the dude meets Dracula at the beginning. Yeah. And mm-hmm. it's kind of like, whoa, this dude's almost transported into another world just by stepping into this guy's old yeah. nerd house, you know? Well, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm glad you said that because I. When I was watching this, I totally got a Dracula and Renfield vibe um, because he he goes to the castle of the monster um, and he kind of enters freely of his own will and invites the horror into himself, even though he's going to the monster's lair. The Mm -hmm. monster is very well spoken and elegant and everything, but has a savage side to him. Except, again, that that's also where you get the Victor Frankenstein aspects with the fact that he creates he creates the monster, you know. Um, but, yeah, we got our dear Howard Howe, the, uh, Howard Howe who he uh, recounts the tale of Mr. Tusk, how he supposedly saved him. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it seems to be kind of a heartwarming story of survival and that kind of stuff. Um, but of course, our dear Wallace, despite his mustachioed brilliance, cannot uh keep hold his tea, uh, and he comes to the drug. Actually, let's let's back up just a minute. This one actually harkens back a little bit to the film we were just talking about with Hannibal. We were talking That's about right. how 
Hannibal is uh, how he would treat rude people. And you can't mm-hmm. help but thinking about that when you're like, cause you've got just, you've got um, Brighton and, and uh, how are doing, they're like trading quotes by Hemingway and the rhyme of the ancient Mariner. And, you know, like this really highbrow literary stuff. And mm-hmm. actually before he even talks about the walrus, he gives an anecdote of a meeting with Hemingway uh, which very much intrigues and amuses Brighton. And so it's very clear that they're both intelligent characters. Mm-hmm. Um, but I couldn't help but thinking about a little bit of, in would Hannibal Lecter in this situation <laughs> take the exact same tack that Hal does, or would he be unable to hold his disgust at this guy's rudeness Uh (laughs) yeah i think there is something to that because they talk about his previous victim in the movie later on being like this college football or hockey jock dude so he was probably like a dick dude disrespect the hockey (laughs) yeah you you also can't say hitler in an airport which is important (laughs) you know advice uh but you just shouldn't say hitler in public places probably uh but you know they do kind of hint to maybe he's got a similar bent to Mm lector in that he kills people that are kind of dicks you know yeah because i'll bet you that hockey jock was a bit of a dick too and very much probably the same american pie style way that uh justin long was you know yeah gum tree was his name um Mm -hmm. and uh this movie does kind of jump around in time a bit with the uh you know, we see some things a little bit non-linearly. I know that uh, Kevin Smith was influenced quite a bit by Tarantino even before you met him and before he was a Miramax, a Miramax tier, as he likes to call himself. <laughs> um, and uh, I know that he was trying to play around with structure a bit, and so that's why you see some of that uh, jumping mm-hmm. around in the past with like his girlfriend played by the... Uh, amazingly beautiful and talented genesis rodriguez um Mm -hmm. who is a long time what i said i haven't seen her in anything in a long time yeah i i wonder what else she's doing um but i think she does a stellar job in this um because she she was the one who was warning him not to go to canada Mm -hmm. um you know, she basically wants him to be around more and he so it's like you get why she would go into the arms of his best friend because you know she wants him there with her and he's not and he, and he's not not just not physically there but like mentally he's pretty clear, clearly not there anymore and uh you know so it's no surprise why she would go into the arms of someone that is physically and mentally yeah. there um but Even uh, if he is an 8 year old in a man's body you know yeah. continue I still All say right. she's the to come mhm um but uh, yeah, we see a little bit of flashbacks there before we realize that uh, his uh, leg has been amputated. Because uh, mm-hmm. at first, it's looking like, according to Howard, it looks like uh, he said, "Oh, you got a spider bite," and uh, you know, it's not that at all. His leg is not there anymore. It's and this missing. Is where- this is where we know Howard tips his hand, either intentionally or unintentionally, that he's full of shit. Uh-huh. And he does the same thing later when he's talking to Guy Lepont. He uh-huh. conflates the brown recluse and the hobo spider, and they are not the same. Uh-huh. Not remotely. So you definitely, you know that he uh, doesn't, either there was no spider or he don't know shit for spiders. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, I love uh, how he's like stifling laughter, like part of the way through it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like it's, it is kind of hilarious if he just chopped a dude's leg off and you're like telling him this bullshit about a spider yeah you know? right. well and that's that's also where you know yeah. we learn that he's not wheelchair bound you know no, that's later you know, oh, that's dinner. later that's right um, <laughs> the dinner scene i believe yeah which this gold um, bricker can walk yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Like, right. there's that part where he's like, you know, well, the morphine will make you drowsy, and he just looks at him with murder in his eyes. <laughs> I'm not asleep. I'm just paralyzed. You know. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. that that whole thing with you see the limbs gradually come off, and mm-hmm. uh, the gradual transformation of it all is pretty grotesque in its own right. 
So apparently Genesis Rodriguez, uh, she is, she is a big part of the Big Hero 6 mm-hmm. television series. She's still in a lot of voice work nowadays. And uh, I guess she was uh, a, a voice as Perfuma in the, uh, the new She-Ra yeah. Uh, yeah. series. I, and re- recently really? she was in a movie called Centigrade. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, I remember. I remember seeing her. Series was pretty good. I remember seeing her in a in a in a, in a series of Gillette commercials with Kate Upton. Hmm. Well, and uh, I know that uh, speaking of Shira, I know that Kevin Smith, one of his big projects right now is actually the the new He Man series for I believe Netflix. Um, hmm. So that's pretty cool. And um, I'm not I'm sure if. That. I'm not sure if Genesis Rodriguez, I'm not sure if she's a part of that, but if she's part of She-Ra, then there's probably an easy, easy yeah, crossover there. Reason, yeah, that she's mm-hmm. going to end up yeah. there, especially if they redo some of those old specials and stuff. Yeah, sure. exactly. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's where uh, we get the idea that not only can he still walk, but, you know, it makes it clear that he wants to recreate his dear companion mr tusk yeah he just tells him like he's yeah. like all right let's drop the fucking trade here yeah this guy's got a little bit too much of an interest in um uh, in 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 mr tusk uh mm-hmm. or or indeed in uh walruses in general although there was one great line that he did have where they, I think uh, Bright must have said something like, why are you doing this or something? To solve a riddle older than the Sphinx, to answer yeah. the question <laughs> which has plagued us since we first crawled from this earth and stood yeah. erect in the sun, is man indeed a walrus at heart? <laughs> yeah. You know, and I, that, I've asked myself what? that question precisely never. You know, so. I ain't kidding. I ask myself that question every day. <laughs> well, now I do. Uh, yeah. Well, well but that's, I mean, that's probably that, the question behind "I'm the Walrus," isn't it? Yeah. Well, well I mean, I, I, I think that's but that's who's a, the honestly is what we have to ask ourselves. Right. I know. Doctor <laughs> Doctor Robotnik is the Eggman, my friend. It's true. Uh, <laughs> well, now it's funny because like that's one of those lines that people would be like, "What?" But I mean, I, I think really what he's getting at is something that uh, it's it's expressed in kind of an intentionally, you know, what the fuck kind of way. But he's getting at, you know, the animality in, uh, inside of everyone. You know, that's really what he's getting at. And, um, you know, that, that's a classic theme. And uh, it's explored in a very different sort of way. But I mean, that well, theme is imagine- as old as time. I well, he imagine, clearly hit humanity. I mm-hmm. imagine that he had a similar relationship like Tom Hanks did in Castaway with <laughs> with, with, with the volleyball uh, ball. Wilson, yeah. I don't know, man. There was moments <laughs> where it seemed like it was leaning a certain way as they were building up to the reveal where I was like, did he eat it or did he? I don't know. Yeah, you which know. we... Maybe my brain's just fucked like that. They probably ate him for survival. Yeah. And missed him terribly afterwards. So he was looking for someone to replace him. That's precisely it. (laughs) um, Well, that's what happened. (laughs) That's not what I thought it was going towards for a minute. Uh, You you wanted some of that hardcore man on I don't know what I thought was going to happen exactly. I know you, Mo. You wanted hardcore human on Walrus. It seemed like it was yeah, leaning towards some... uh, some some walrus play. It's yeah. Now, some well, walrus okay. on Brokeback Mountain shit, you know? Oh, God. Well, the, uh, the, the big motivation there, though, behind his whole action, besides what you just said, is trying to recreate his best friend and to try to, you know, uh, make up for the fact that he had to eat his friend in order to survive. Mm-hmm. But it's also that he is a... Duplessis orphan, uh, I believe. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. <laughs> yeah, I think you got it right. So that uh, that whole thing, twenty thousand Canadian children who were wrongly certified as mentally ill by the provincial government of Quebec yeah. and confined to psychiatric institutions in the nineteen forties and nineteen fifties, and basically, if I'm recalling this correct, yeah, yeah, they were the ones who were 
horrifically like sexually abused by the Catholic Church um, yeah. at that time. If memory serves, and, too, this is not total untruth. You know, it's like that, that's a, what, a no, thing it's, that happened that's, there that really and happened. like down here in several places. Actually. That's right. Well, that that whole era partic- was a particularly bad instance of clerical abuse and you know on a pretty horrific level even beyond the usual um and uh so that already that sets up a lot about why his character is doing what he's doing and it gives him an extra dimension i think and it makes it uniquely canadian on top of that um now i i know that uh michael parks did not give him a Canadian accent of, of any kind of, uh, recognizable kind or anything, wow. but, uh, nonetheless, I mean, that does, this is the first installment of the true North trilogy. And, uh, you know, they make it a point to emphasize the fact that this is a Canadian story, um, not only in its setting, but in terms of some of the history, uh, in terms of that one and actually yoga hosers gets into some of the, um some of the nazi movements that took place in canada and in the united states also uh during world war ii so i mean there is some real life history sprinkled in here um Mm -hmm. and of course that's where we get into the full range of grotesqueries with the human to walrus transformation that he's sewing him into this walrus suit basically and it becomes like a second skin for before they do that, he manages oh. to get off a couple of terrified phone calls to his uh, That's right. uh, your old friend and his, uh, I'm going to keep saying that because of uh, what Mo was saying, <laughs> eight-year-olds, dude. Yeah, <laughs> yeah her That's little right. man-child <laughs> boyfriend. That's <laughs> right. It was somehow, we somehow, love you, somehow, Haley Joel, but you look like you're eight. Even with a full <laughs> Al Borland beard. That's a weird thing. And you should somehow embrace manages it. to score this unbelievably beautiful girl. And, they, and you get this great thing where you find out, you, 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 you know, they're like charging their phones together next to each other in the bathroom when he calls them. That's almost dirtier like, than just having the affair, you know what I mean? Like, that's kind of strangely intimate nowadays, you know? Like, <laughs> shit, they're docking their phones up right. on the same break. Like, <laughs> But he gets it. I almost got a little bit briefly, a little bit of a Blair Witch vibe from the way he's doing those little phone calls, like the sort of the uh, which I get, I guess it makes sense in that situation. You're going to sound like that, but you know, it just <laughs> reminded me a lot of that. Um, but they, of course, uh, once they get the calls the next morning, <laughs> they uh start the process of trying to find him and uh yeah Yeah, and their credit you know like they both probably kind of wanted him out of their lives by this point but they were dependent on him in weird ways and you know so they could have just left him maybe and she could have started co-hosting the show with him like bobby lee and his wife well you got the impression that she was genuinely decent and she was upset with the fact that he had become such a Jerk. Oh, frick, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so she wouldn't have let him out to dry. I don't know about his friend without her influence, if he would have or not. He seemed yeah, he was in it for the sex. Well, but it's a very believable <laughs> reason why they would fall into each other's arms. Like, it's not like she's uh, no, trying no. to hurt him or whatever. It's just that, you know, when one person pulls away, then oftentimes that leaves him open for you know, being picked up by someone else. Mm-hmm. And, and it's, well, not it, like, uh, it's not like uh, uh, Osmond didn't uh, warn his friend. It's like they, they, the guy straight told him he was going to be picking up chicks on the road. And he's like, you know, you shouldn't do that. And he's like, well, am I going to say no? <laughs> right. And that brings up an important point about those messages because Justin Long's character is like, uh, Brighton or whatever his name is is like mm-hmm. saying how sorry he is in one of them. It's like mother, this guy wasn't fucking sorry before he had like a leg amputated. And he was yeah. pumped full of morphine, like scooting around some old weird dude's mansion in the Only middle of nowhere. While tortured under pain of death, as he admitting his guilt. yeah, that made him like even <laughs> less sympathetic to me. That he was like, I'm sorry, I was a dick before, and it's like, no, you're not, you dickhole. You Which, were like actively uh, still being one after you. He declined her phone call. Now you know it's. There. 
you know, you know what's funny though, because I I watched the movie again with the commentary track on just to get see what kind of other insights that I could glean from the whole thing. Because mm -hmm. I I watched the movie, watched the commentary track, and I watched the documentary Walrus Yes about the making of the movie. Um, so I'm you got a pretty good spread of the whole thing. The commentary track, according to Kevin Smith, he, uh, Justin Long, was originally supposed to be a guy who would go on the road and fuck swingers and then talk about that on the podcast and, like, oh. openly openly tell his girlfriend, you know, you knew who you were getting with, you know, when you were with me. So it was like, and it was actually Justin Long who was basically saying, you know, people are going to want me to be in that walrus suit, but maybe not right away, you know, you know not to have me, not have people wanting to, like, shove me in there <laughs> in the first 10 <laughs> minutes or whatever. So, I mean, point being that it could have been a lot worse as far as hey, him being you know a what, scumbag. Uh, they could have been Weirdly, some losers. Go ahead. That would have made him more sympathetic to me, because honestly, that's kind of fair play, bro. If, if like, he's a swinger and he, you know it, like he's gonna be bang, he's gonna be going to key parties, hanging out in those fucking mm -hmm. social yeah. pits. They call them on those seventies folk. I know what was going on. There was a fishbowl full of keys in the middle of that. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, uh, it's if if that's his lifestyle, I don't think it's like cool to just rule that out as them being, you know, scummy. Like if she knew that from the get go, then that's different. But mm -hmm. it, in this, they made it. I think they did the right choice. And made mm -hmm. him unsympathetic because you want him to. F I did want. I, I didn't care anymore after, especially after that fucking point where he was like leaving that fake ass apology on the the yeah. voicemail. I was like, fuck this dude. I think he believed it at the time, but he definitely Maybe. did. Do, you know the way he was so rude to the old man, the way he kept unintentionally, but still just by his assholeness, I kept. Uh, annoying that border agent at the uh at, you yeah. know at the crossing um and, and i did like that little mini lecture on on what not to do in canada that was some good times but yeah, uh like that. <laughs> the canadoos and the canadons so and then of right. course you've got, the whole, you've got the whole thing that their podcast they call themselves the not see party yeah which i they explain it in the film but it's like oh come on if you're going to have a sound alike to Nazi party, you're going to expect some blowback. Oh, of course. <laughs> yeah. I, think, I, think, I think that's kind of the image they were going for, yeah. though. They totally seem like the kind of people that would get off on the controversy yeah. that that would generate, you know. But there was it that just part felt like a lazy though. joke after the first time, you know. There was like that it was part funny later that first time. Film where it, was, it was interesting later in the film where they had the thing where they're trying to call the cops and they were talking about, well, you can call NaziParty.com. It's like, no, this would be a really good example, a really good time not to say that, but to spell it out. Right. <laughs> well, it's, well, I'll give, I'll give uh, Jake a point in terms of uh, like you're like, you know, not challenging himself or whatever. One thing I'll, I will completely agree with you on that. I will agree with it insofar as like, I know that when he started picking up like regular pot smoking to be creative, which he got from mm -hmm. Seth Rogen, I know mm -hmm. that when Kevin Smith started doing that, I personally think that kind of hurt his comedic timing and his uh, overall mm -hmm. humor. I think it supposedly, supposedly helped his work ethic quite a bit more. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's true, but like uh, I don't think it necessarily did any wonders for his his humor because like a drug that slows you down in yeah. some way tends to not be great for you know comedic timing which that's all about speed and rhythm and all that stuff and um, you know, one i of found the, it quite helpful the film over the he years did with so Rogan, i think it's one of his funnier films oh uh uh zach and mary yeah zach and mary was a good film i right? like that one yeah. um but yeah, we have our human to walrus transformation, all that good shit. The tusks are made from tibia bones from his severed yeah, it's legs. His feet. Yeah, it's yeah. fucking awesome. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he, <laughs> should have, he should have been repurposing that fucking leg flesh as walrus feed, though. 
<laughs> that would have been a cool little Hannibal Lecter like nod there. Well, well, the, uh, the, yeah, the, the transformation walrus... was pretty. The transformation was pretty gross. Well, the yeah. not, one thing that's cool though is the walrus suit there. It's actually made from various pieces of human flesh and that kind of stuff. And you saw yeah. like mm-hmm. some like faces, faces on the back. Right. No, it had geekiness to them. Yeah, exactly, and that's. That's one of my favorite things about it, as I uh, I was really blown away by how grotesque that was, and how I was like, you know, I could believe that someone could make something like this. Um, yeah, and, uh, well, at that point in the movie, that is not what I was ex- expecting. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I thought it was going to be some type of like flayed walrus. That, uh-huh. but then again, you know, it makes sense that he wouldn't want to kill another walrus. Right, uh-huh. right. And he thinks of humans as so low. So it was like one of those things where it's like, holy shit. You well, know, and, well, and, and right. Then the fact that Justin Long is so in there is no irony. Uh, yeah, the irony of that's not lost on me or whatever. Because mm-hmm. he was sewed into a fucking flesh cathedral in Jeepers Creepers. So mm-hmm. it's <laughs> it was a cool nod to that as well. Uh, mm-hmm. Most definitely. He's yeah. just broadcasting those nature documentaries on the wall. And as I'm watching that, too, I'm like, you know what? Walruses are kind of fucking badass, though. They, they are. Got big old tusks, <laughs> and they're just big old fat, angry bastards that are like, <laughs> you know, like yeah. dead banging while they kill people. And, you know, talking about the appropriateness of casting, uh, seeing Justin Long in a Kevin Smith movie tends to make me happy because... Um, one of the most unjustly reviled comedies, I think, uh, that hit a lot of the same beats as Clerks, and hit and hit just right, just here in the in the in the old uh, heart uh, for people like me who've worked in customer service uh, that long starred in was Waiting. Waiting was a much better film than the critics thought it was. Mm-hmm. It wasn't deep. But anyone who's worked food service, just like anyone who's worked customer service, gets clerks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, exactly. And it's probably equally gross to this in different ways. You know? right. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, um, that also brings us to um, one of the other... Well, because the whole idea is, is that... Uh, as he's playing the role of Mr. Tusk, that he has to really be the walrus, um, mm-hmm. you know, which uh, we talked about this in chat, but it's like, if they could have somehow gotten, not the Beatles version, because again, it costs an ungodly <laughs> amount to license the Beatles these but days. At least the Oingo Boingo. Yeah, if they could have gotten a version of I Am the Walrus, that would have been appropriate. Yeah. Although, they did, apparently the, the Fleetwood Mac song, Tusk, they managed to get the rights to, which that apparently it was like one of the biggest budget items um, on the whole thing but like um, something it? like that yeah um but it's uh i think it's very uh yeah he has to learn how to be the walrus and basically what i interpreted that as is that he had to not only embrace his animal side but he had to basically give up his humanity and yeah. that's, of course, the great trap that he falls into is that he does indeed become the walrus in all of the various ways. Like he learns how to yes. become a, a killer. And, um, you know, so that it's it's an internal transformation as well as an external one. See, um, I've never interpreted it as him playing along. No, like, no. At any point. It's that he's like driven fucking insane by the fact that this dude hacked yeah. off his legs and sewed him into a goddamn flesh suit made to look exactly. like a walrus. So he's yeah. kind of everything he says because he's kind of like in prison. You know? I don't even think it's that, dude. I think he's just mentally snapped at a certain point there, and I'm pretty sure I it happens that. at that point where yeah. he tries to like make him swim. And then exactly. he brings him out. And I think it's like after that mm-hmm. is when he's so fucking like hungry that he ends up eating the damn fish. Right. And yeah. at that point, he's like, you know what? I'm just the walrus. I'm going to kill this motherfucker the, like the certain the, the second yeah. I get the chance, you know? Well, and let's not forget the fact that uh, one of the more gruesome details that we do not get to see, but we hear about it, which is the case with the other walruses that were attempted. Mm-hmm. Uh, is that they all get their tongues cut out so that yeah, they yeah. can't speak. And all he can do is bellow like a walrus. And so it's mm-hmm. like he can't even go back even if he wanted to. 
Dude, um, that's the most disturbing part of the fucking yes. movie is his I think screams so, yeah. and shrieks and howls and shit. Like, uh, he nailed it. If that was all just actually him doing it in the take, holy yeah. shit. Is that well, and and Kevin, Kevin Smith actually mentioned that, well, he was like, to, to his favorite part of directing is watching actors act, you know, <laughs> just creating the environment for them to do what they do. Um, but particularly with Justin Long, because he was like, you know, I think he might have actually referenced Cheaper's Creepers, but um, he referenced some other things too. But basically, saying that he can communicate so much with just his eyes, you know, and it's true. Dude, you know, can... Yeah, and I mean, it's that's that type of shit. Like even on set, knowing it's that dude in a suit, I think mm-hmm. I'd have had to step away at a certain point there. You know, mm-hmm. I'll blow yeah. your head up all fucking day. You know, but I don't want that was weird, it, you know, mm-hmm. and it really drove it, home the whole vibe of the, that whole second half of the movie. There, and it know. does lend uh, a sense of again, like he's pretty good with that sense of creeping dread or whatever, where like you know, there can be no happy ending for this character after a certain point, yeah. Yeah, meanwhile, you have these two, along with Guy Lapont, uh, trying to find him. <laughs> and you, uh, you, you're you like, they're trying They're trying their best. You want to root for them. But you're mm-hmm. like, but there will be no happy ending, no matter how quick they are. You know, and that's kind of an interesting little aspect to that. If you um, want a happy ending in this movie, it's when Guy Lapont spikes his fucking milkshake. That's <laughs> like the, the best part of the movie almost in Which, terms of he had, he had a couple of, you know. he had a Which, couple of good moments there was the part where he recounts where he thought he met the killer before and that was a part where you got to see not only Johnny Depp overacting and again did anyone else agree with me that he looked like Columbo trying to pretend he was a Canadian <laughs> um, like he had the lazy eye and the brown trench coat and he, well, and and that he, sort of goofy vibe that Columbo cultivated it all those years. You know, you know, Jake. I love you to death, but I'm gonna have to be the dude to say this. I think, you know, being as we bring up Columbo precisely, never. <laughs> you bring it up like every other episode. <laughs> You're probably the the person who's watched it the most, or ever, out of a lot of us, you know. But uh, I do know of Columbo, but uh, no, I don't know what you're talking about. The other part of it, though, is in that scene, Michael Parks decided to go for broke and overact like crazy, and so this is is fun. And again, I thought of him as some sort of weird Stephen Root mashup, where he was like part Bill Drotrieve. Part that dude, what was his name? Melvin from Office Space? Well, the, like the so, stapler guy. <laughs> the only one I know is Dwight. Uh, oh, so you're, thi- ba- you're thinking of The Office, not Office Space. Oh, no, um, Office Space. Oh, there's more than one. Ugh. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. No, Office Space was there. Great. Michael Fudge film with uh, Ron Mike Livingston. Chuck. Yeah, yeah. Office Space is fucking awesome, dude. It is. We need to do that. I would, say, I would say my Office Space speaks to office workers as much the way the clerk speaks to retail workers. Right. It I does. haven't watched Office Space in a long time, but I saw it though in college. But well, the with the uh, the Gila Point, he uh, is the <laughs> Manhunter from uh, Quebec, and he has the the funny accent and. Uh, yeah, like how he spikes that milkshake and just crushes that slider down right on the fucking right. table like he doesn't yeah. even care about germs yeah. i love it you know? <laughs> if you're eating like some fast food slider though you're probably getting a few anyway well, you know? <laughs> he was probably also coming off of a jack sparrow mordecai moment so <laughs> yeah well honestly i i really like gila point as a character because i think at that point in the story, like we've seen so much grotesquery that he's a little bit of comedic relief, but he also uh, he gives Johnny Depp an opportunity to play an eccentric character, which we all know he loves to play. Mm-hmm. But also, I think he, on an archetypical level, he's is the Van Helsing of the movie, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and for some reason, to me, he just kind of works. He he fits mm-hmm. this. He fits this kind of somewhat like it's mm-hmm. horrific film, but also it's got a little bit of the absurd and he 
has it some of that cross eye. <laughs> you could it also it, 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 edited differently. It would have been better placed, and I mean, because it does feel like a drastic departure at that point. Granted, the movie has gotten pretty disturbing. I think right. by that point. So, well, I, I, but I could I could buy that a character like him would exist though because like right he does... I can too I'm just saying if you edited it differently where the phone calls came closer to the beginning of their interaction and then Guy Lap you know Guy Lafonte or whatever gets involved and then we don't see him again through the, the disturbing bits of the movie until the end and it kind of brings me, it full circle for me personally i like that we weren't dwelling on the disturbing for a large sure you of did jake smoother. We, yeah we could have probably tightened up a few bits but um i do think that he him being who he is i think kind of helps to balance out He's a good foil, just like how Van Helsing's a good foil for Dracula. I think Gila Point's a good foil for uh, Goofy for is, Howard. He confident too. You know? for, for the, to reference another horror film we have covered, he is kind of this film's Ahab as well. A little bit, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, he's he's surprisingly competent for being yeah. as dumb as he is. You know, like yeah. you could see that yeah. scene with him accidentally meeting the dude. Yeah. play out in a more serious movie yeah and still have gone the same way it's like i kind of had like a feeling yeah. about that dude like something was off but yeah. um, at the time i took him for a simple imbecile you know which now funny thing about that scene which is great that i got this from the commentary track um well the voice that howard slash michael parks the voice that he's putting on there, it's not just to disguise who he is from the authorities, which that's the practical reason. But um, apparently the voice that he was adopting there was, uh, I don't know if it was, I think it was kind of unintentional. I think it was a coincidence, but like the voice that he has there was actually apparently very similar to the way that Kevin Smith's late father talked Hmm. Because his father was born with a cleft palate and had to get that um, fixed in some hmm. way. Um, and so, yeah, the way he spoke, uh, uh, it, I don't think it was, he didn't do it intentionally, but he was like, yeah, that my dad used to speak like that. Hmm. Um, so, I mean, but it does serve a practical function in the story that it shows that he has been doing this for a while and that he has a serial killer pattern, but also mm -hmm. that he's good enough at putting on this persona. Plus he lives in the middle of nowhere in Manitoba, mm -hmm. which is one of the lesser populated provinces, if I recall. And he had it's one also of the a more, common uh, speech uh, pattern for old dudes who won't wear right. their hearing aids. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, my so, dad be doing that shit sometimes. He once sat here without his dentures, without his hearing aid, calling Rambo Lambo for three whole movies and I could not stop watching them with them because I was just like that is fucking hilarious yeah, you know? yeah. my dad's like 80 plus you know I don't even know how fucking old he is honestly yeah, uh, it's awful but... uh, kind of, <laughs> it's it was fucking creative. hilarious man I love it he showed some very amusing creativity there too and the whole like he was fixated on you know like there was a spider in the uh what i can't remember what he called the uh i well, think he was referring to the guy didn't get it but yeah yeah but he uh he was talking about that spider again uh brown recluse or oh boy you know, he, <laughs> he also in his fancier role called it a water closet at one point and right i think we should bring that back you know but yeah, it was just, I found that kind of an amusing, and at the same time, a creative way. Oh shit, the cops. How am I going to get rid of them? Are you here to take care of that spider? Yeah. <laughs> and I, I liked Laponte's de, uh, his demurral of like, uh, something like, I'm not trained to shoot a bug with my, or something like that. Like, well, yeah, he's not yeah. authorized to destroy a firearm at a bug. <laughs> But he did seem genuinely disappointed that he wasn't, you know, right. mm -hmm. which is one element I took away from that scene, too. Like, yeah, you know what? It would be pretty cool to shoot fucking spiders, honestly. It I, would, I which uh, said... I'm trying to wrap up plot here because basically, okay. uh, basically long story, the plot is over. Well, long story short, yeah. you know, they his uh, girlfriend and his friend, they managed to track down 
Uh, mm-hmm. Howard and Wallace. Howard has engaged Wallace in Mortal Kombat with his own walrus suit. Uh, Fucking Wallace, epic. Yeah, Wallace, Wallace has to basically gore him to death, and in so in doing so, he basically becomes the walrus fully. And mm. you get that fake out where you think Gila Point's going to put him out of his misery, but in fact, they preserve him in a wildlife you know, sanctuary. <laughs> Which is where... stupid. Yeah. It's mad stupid. I mean, let's yeah. be honest. That's that's where the movie goes. I love the movie. Guy Le... Guy should have shot his ass. He well, should have put a... As, I, apparently on the commentary track, uh, Kevin Smith was debating whether or not to end it there. Um, and uh, the But the thing that he, he kept in the little epilogue there because of her whole speech about um, how crying separates humans from the animals and so you see that he has not yeah. like he he has fully become the walrus in a lot of ways but then upon seeing her that his humanity is still preserved in there with his tears but he's now essentially imprisoned in his walrus uh exterior you, you know and what would have been less stupid though is if they just had that dialogue earlier in the movie or even did it in voiceover as yeah. he's looking at her and crying, and then they blow his brains out. Because the ending, as much as I find the 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 littering of big gulp cups mm-hmm. hilarious, mm-hmm. is pretty fucking stupid. You know, they probably kind of does they, actually they probably ruin a good movie. They probably could have tightened that up. Uh, you're you're probably right. They could have tightened that up. Lame I mean, AF, as the kids. That say. is essentially the plot, but. Um, well, the the big thing that I wanted to shout out uh, was also some of the effects work with uh, Robert mm-hmm. Kurtzman of the famous uh, K&B makeup group, having been the point man on the walrus suit. Um, and, you know, it his does. work definitely shines in this. Um, A lot of emotive he- facial shit with Justin Long, I'm assuming. Still yeah. Under- like he was I in have- the walrus suit. I have Brandon's uh, viewpoint real quickly here. Hey, okay. here. We, he wanted me to uh, express this, but I, ha- I haven't had a chance to. Um, I had dreaded watching this film because I am not a fan of body horror. And this one very much falls into that genre. It really is a two-part film with the body horror section being the strongest bit with excellent dialogue and timing. Still not a fan of it. The rest with Johnny Depp and those tracking him down is kind of slower and more boring to me. Mm-hmm. He's, he said he felt that Yoga Horses was actually a better version of the Depp part of the film. And mm-hmm. he was uh, he, he was sure that if Yoga Horses had taken off, we would have seen another movie in that universe. Well, mm-hmm. we still will. He's still making Moose Paws. Mm-hmm. Um, as long as that's awesome and not some fucking bullshit like college humor shit. Mm-hmm. Uh, which I'm sure will be a factor in it, but will make more sense in like a creatures killing kids in the wood movie. Right. Uh, well, as as long as he sticks true to the central premise, which is Jaws with the moose, that's basically what it is. Yeah, and, that's and, all okay, I care about. And earlier we had the discussion of St- Strange Brew, so mm-hmm. maybe for the third one, Kevin Smith will actually go take the production to Canada so that he can get Rick Moranis involved. Oh, that'd be cool. Rick Moranis and Dave Thomas somehow in there. Actually, which Atlanta was right here in New York. Nice. Uh Yeah. Rick Moranis lives in New York. Um, Doesn't he? He lived in Canada. Well, he's from Canada originally. Walks away from Spook Central. No, he lives in New York. That's why he got punched in the fucking face walking down the street recently. (laughs) I'm sorry, Rick. I'm not laughing because that's funny. I know you read that he doesn't travel anymore, but I thought he lived in Canada. Okay. Well, he's from. He's from back to Canada. He's from Canada originally. Right. But to anyone else on special effects, to tie it in the very quickly to the fact that this is a regional horror thing so despite this being very canadian in its identity it was shot uh in cramerton north carolina which is actually just uh it's on my route to work every day um Mm. and it's in a mansion that's around here um 
And in the documentary Walrus, yes, you get to see him and a him and his wife in a hotel room um, in de- uptown Charlotte. And I was like, and he was giving a lot of shout out to the Charlotte people and to the North Carolina crew and all that stuff. And I was like, yay, good for you, spread the nice. word, man. Um, okay, well, since you touched on that, I mean, yes, now please. might be a good time to Go uh, fire it. off our regional recommendations here from the regional horror films of mm-hmm. 1958 to 1990, a state-by-state state guide with interviews by Brian Albright. Uh, we're just going to read them off real quick here, no explanation, just movies and directors, baby. Uh, so this was North Carolina, eh? uh, We got Alien Outlaw from 1985, directed by Phil Smoot, pretty fucking cool last name. Uh, we got <laughs> another son of Sam, aka Hostage, from 1977, directed by Dave Adams, probably some type of alias. Uh, we got Axe, aka Lisa Lisa, from 1974, directed by Frederick R. Friedel, very much a similarly confusing name to Howard Howe, uh, because <laughs> it's just basically the same fucking name. Uh, Mm -hmm. We also got The Body Shop, a.k.a. Dr. Gore, from 1972, uh, directed by J.G. Patterson, Jr. Uh, We have Carnival Magic from 1982, directed by Al Adamson. Uh, We have Dark Power from 1985, directed by Phil Smoot. A couple of repeat offenders on this list here. We got A Day of Judgment by C.D.H. Reynolds. Just calm down, dude. What are you, a fucking medical doctor? Uh, that's too many fucking initials in the first part of the name. There. <laughs> Death Screams, a.k.a. House of Death, directed by David Nelson. And then uh, I promise you we are coming to an end here. We got uh, Dogs of Hell, a.k.a. Rottweiler from 1982, Worth Keeter. We got Final Exam. Dustin watched that recently, was not impressed by it, if memory serves. I liked it. Uh, I thought it I was... was. I was a little let down. I was expecting more of a. I was expecting more brutality. You wanted right. your you I wanted mean, your walrus the, werewolf movie. So. Well, you just wanted your '80s slasher where they sell <laughs> yeah. it to you with the fucking poster artist being right, like sell it to you great. right away. Yeah, uh, yeah. it's not bad. Yeah. It would have been like a good like on TV broadcast back in the day, which I'm sure it got. Yeah, final of. final <laughs> exam ended up being it ended up being pretty good. It was just not what I was expecting. Yeah, not great. All right. Uh, Did we want to do? Hold on, hold on. Okay. Hold your horses, sir. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Co-ed. A.K.A. Date with a Kidnapper, The Kidnapped, and a bunch of other fucking titles I'm not reading by Dave R., that dude with two last names. Uh, we got <laughs> Killer from 1989 by Tony Elwood. We got The Mutilator, which I actually have a review for if you want to check nice. it out on my channel. Um, it's it's Buddy Cooper did that bitch. We got Tale of the Third Dimension. Uh, and then closing it out here, we have Wolfman from 1979. Directed Sweet. by Worth Keeter as well. Sweet. So that's that's our coverage for speaking of Virginia's. uh it's speaking been strongly of great... virginial up in this bitch, you know. Speaking we did of a great Julianne Moore movie earlier that she was in uh, Big Lebowski, so that makes sense. Okay. Go ahead, Jake. I feel like I need to give a shout out. When I was watching the final credits, the makeup department started up and the first name was a man named Alan Tuskis or Tuskis. Uh. And I'm just thinking, with this particular movie, was that a coincidence? I don't know. But what a great name for someone working on a film like this. <laughs> I know. Um, and then uh, favorite scenes. Mm-hmm. What would I, our favorite scene be? I don't know <laughs> that I have one, man. I think just uh, the general walrusness. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, I think uh, my favorite scene is like the ending where he finally like just goes insane and stabs the guy with the tusks. I enjoy yeah. that. <laughs> so. I, I had a couple. Oh, go ahead. I was gonna say, well, say I though, enjoyed. So. I enjoyed the story that uh, that uh, that uh, our Mister Howe uh, to, uh, told about the uh, walrus and uh, how he got into it, and, uh, jazz, and the initial yeah. transformation of the walrus. So. Mm-hmm. I'm going to say Shout that, out to in, that Ernest Hemingway bit, though, you know, right. like that was fun stuff. Uh, I was going to say that initial interaction basically between Brighton and how that whole discussion was a great scene overall. Yeah. And it was just well done. It was well scripted. It was great atmosphere. Great, you know, 
sense of creeping dread, but also good dialogue floating back and forth and what have you. And, um, but my single favorite moment was the moment y'all can look at my little icon there. I captured it for posterity. And that is the scene where they have found Brighton's car and Guy Lepont sits down and flips open that little thing. And he's got that great big gun. It's going to be his gun and two little pistols. And he picks them up and hands them to the other two. And, yes. and they demur. They're like, uh, I think uh, Osmond's character says something like, I don't want a gun. And in, yeah. in, Basically, in, my in, tiny eight-year-old hands can't hold exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> it's this baffled look. Take you the fucking gun. <laughs> you don't want a gun? What, what kind of an American are you? Yes. <laughs> That was good. Yeah, that was uh, great. <laughs> I think my favorite, uh, the initial meeting with Howard, I think is, that's really great. I mean, anytime that Michael Parks is on the screen is just amazing. He's mm-hmm. a criminally underrated actor. Mm-hmm. Uh, what about you, what about you oh. Forrest? Uh, I probably have to agree, agree with uh, with Dustin, the uh, walrus fight. Uh mm-hmm. <laughs> Fuck yeah! Says, and it's just—I mean, it's—it's it's, on one hand, it's—it's it's fucking hilarious, but at the same time, very disturbing. Hmm. And David, right, it's like it—it it comes at that moment where he's when you see him in that fucking walrus mask, I always start laughing and then immediately like dead stop it, you know, because it's like oh, this is fucking hilarious because he's like, and now Mortal Kombat, you know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. but. It is Can also you... disturbing at the same time, so yeah. you have to take it's, pause for a moment it's, during that. It, it's, it's disturbing to see Haley Joe Osmond still have his baby face. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> baby face. Um, with, but, let's talk but, about this uh, for a second, uh, though. It looked there. like fucking. It looked like Mason would have beat him if his fucking tusks had been anchored into his face. I feel like he <laughs> actually kind of had like a handicap going into the match. I don't know if this is something you guys picked up on. But he was just wearing like a walrus headdress that yeah. really had no like stabbing power, and and the other dude kind of had the advantage with tusks that were actually I'm not sure we he saw wanted... earlier in the swimming. Yeah, scene I think he he wanted were clearly to die, like I anchored think. onto their face. Maybe. Yeah, I think oh, I think he wanted to die personally. What a pussy though, not to build. I mean, especially with the Canadian element, if you had built like a tusk rig. For your head out of a hockey helmet, <laughs> it would have worked great. really good. You know that reminds you know I mean? me. I'm, I'm going to ask you, Mo. I'm going to ask you what your thought on that speech about the colors of the Canadian flag was. That a was that a pretty fun little speech there? It was. Talking? And though Canadians are sometimes blue, the hockey shit is serious business, bro. <laughs> so you just, you know, let's not sit here and compare that to your American football, okay? Because uh, there's no contest. There's no contest, oh, yeah. bud. It's, right. <laughs> it's, it's just... They it's, will tear your no fucking care. head off if you fuck with the hockey. Yeah. I don't know. I think yeah. football comparisons... I always think about another Kevin Smith alum and uh, George Carlin's description of football versus baseball. Oh, I know. <laughs> which, which, hey, you know, some of, some of George Carlin's best on-screen acting... Was yeah. with Kevin Smith, particularly in Jersey Girl. He, he was kind of he was kind of the heart and soul of that thing. And he was. Um, cool. And Forrest can weigh in adequately on the experience of seeing baseball. And I would say, football and hockey are sports or basketball that you go to watch. Baseball is a sport that you go to to visit the stadium. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And, really and then, that's pretty much you don't the deal. Shit when you're actually at a baseball stadium, I've been to. It's games. just kind of dudes hitting balls yeah. and occasionally. Are running we ready to rap? Yep, 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 yep. So right. who wants to go first? I'll go first. So go I'm Justin. I uh, I kind of wish I had a little bit more to say about this one, but this was this was such a strange movie. It was so long, and it only had like so many plot points. Uh, Thanks for showing up, though, man. I mean, I really enjoyed hearing your voice, if anything. No, oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, so, anyway. Uh, Who I'm are you and what you do? A, I'm a horror collector living here in Milwaukee. Um, I have a YouTube channel where I show off my pickups, uh, The Crypt of Horrors. 
And I also have an Instagram for my pickups, The Crypt of Horrors. Um, you can also follow me on Twitter at DurCryptaxis. And that's also my Twitch handle as well, where you'll see me stream games sometimes. Um, so yeah, just give me a follow across uh, all the different dimensions. And I have to get going, so I'll, um, uh, I'll head out. Night, night. Night, night guys. All right. Mo, um, who are, who are you what? and what do you do? What's up? Or either either one. Someone. Forrest, why don't you go? All right, uh, Forrest Bent. I'm uh, based in Long Island, oh, New York. Uh, I don't know what happened there. Avid movie uh, movie go, uh, movie fan and uh, producer. Also, uh, comp aficionado and uh, Camp Crystal Lake survivor. A resident survivor girl. <laughs> Always and forever. <laughs> and it's running myself. All right. Go ahead, Mo. Mm -hmm. Oh shit! Well, well uh, I didn't know we were doing a breakneck pace here, where everyone. <laughs> you know, well, yeah. I'm mostly. I do videos <laughs> sometimes. I have a fucking channel. It's Drunken Master Studios. Uh, I did a few HG Lewis reviews recently. You guys might enjoy. And I had a sizable amount of pickups posted. Mm -hmm. uh, other than that, pretty much I got like the Cinema Slut podcast going on. Be a treat if you guys subscribed over there. Checked out our first couple of discussions. And I got a, one that's going to be posted here real soon. Where me and my lady talked about the classic 80s slasher maniac. So okay. uh, check that out as well. Cool. All right. I guess. Yeah, it is. How about you, Jake? Why don't you I'm go gonna, ahead? I'm Code Buki Jake. I live here in Central Virginia where I co host with our um, frequent contributor who unfortunately sat the night out due to a uh, sore voice, uh, Brandon. Um, we do Septum Sim vs. the World, where it is a uh, channel dedicated to physical media, the collecting, the enjoyment thereof, uh, discussing it. We had a good discussion last night. Uh, the only video that I know we both worked on this week, I think he put up a clip show of the, the week's news, uh, new releases. But we, um, to give his voice a break, we didn't do a pickup video this week. But we did do a discussion last night. I think Dane and Dave joined us of uh, yep. the best films, uh, worst films, sorry, <laughs> Which Brandon was far and away the resident expert on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I was not but, uh, there, man. I only watched well, like well, the, two next movies week we're from the year. Good. So that'll be the important one anyway. We'll be doing a good, again, free form discussion next week. The best films of 2020. Mm -hmm. I think we're following that up with our, like, our personal list of the f year. So that'll probably be just the, like, back to the two of us for that one. But um, we, uh, and, of course, I am a movie fan, collector, uh, what have you. Um, and that's all I'm going to do for tonight. I'm going to go ahead and pop off myself since it's 110 here. Yeah. But right. Jake often teases tonight. us with nature videos that never happen. <laughs> and Eventually. And we <laughs> see him get bit by a fucking lizard. That's pretty much what's going to happen. That's and, Dane, I suppose I can thank you for forcing my hand on finally watching this one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the the expand your horizons. But good out <laughs> everybody. The Great North. Well, um, I'm Dane Kyle. I am a filmmaker, and I have a show on indie horror film creative called Blu-ray Views, where I unbox things, and then... Uh, started up no money film school which is its own youtube channel slash podcast where i have done film commentaries i'll probably do film commentaries on all of the kevin smith films um now that i've you gotten should. through them now now that i've gotten through them all why not um and i'm also a filmmaker and i'm trying to i'm actually doing uh some uh face casting um some special effects face casting uh for uh segment of a of a larger anthology film um doing that tomorrow night uh so that'll be exciting but um yeah i just wanted to shout this film out because it was made right in my own backyard all right which was the point man i mean yeah. the regional fright fest was supposed to be about everyone like getting more movies to collect 
Yeah. From well, their and, backyard. And, you know. and getting movies, you know, made in your backyard that are special. Mm-hmm. And I'm a big yeah. fan of body horror. I'm a big fan of horror comedy. I like Kevin Smith. I like, you know, the grotesquerie. And I like that this was made in, you know, a town that I drive through every day to get to work. So, you know, hopefully with my own. Right. Films, and I'm, I'm hoping like the submissions from this bitch right, are, are going to like help people, you know, grab some stuff that's outside of the the more mainstream shit or exactly uh, the stuff that might not get mentioned on this this whole month mm-hmm. you know and then david <clears throat> there's lots who are of you? movies in your region that you probably don't even know about well so that's right check them out definitely cool man uh my name is david streggy i am one of the founding fathers of uh, inside movies galore so come with us and continue this journey as next week we are going to go on about Candyman um, as well as uh, Just Before Dawn, which is going to be hosted, well, Candyman by Dustin and Mosley and uh, Mo and Forrest. Well, and those uh, are all Illinois, actually, correct? I am. Yes. Oregon. Both of those are. Well, For Oregon just is dawn. Just Before Dawn. Okay. So. But Candyman keep, is Illinois. Keep a good ear out for that discuss, uh, those two discussions. Uh, w- one being on Delusions of Grandeur and the other being on Inside Movies Galore. But also, as I mentioned, Delusions of Grandeur, I also moonlight under that channel as I do my own pickup video, uh, video, video reviews and the like. So please make sure you check out my viewpoints. They may not be the greatest shit that you've heard. But they are de- uh, definitely unique, I, th- I think, in my perspective. So, um, That's all one can ask for, right? <laughs> yep. So uh, thank you for listening, ladies and gentlemen. Keep your walruses close to you. Don't be that walrus in the room. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, stay tuned the, for more. Be the best walrus you can be. Do you think they installed a baculum for Justin Long when they put him in the in the walrus suit? Yeah. (laughs) Night off. Night, everybody.